Ukrainians in this country have frequently displayed their concern and indignation about what is happening in Ukraine, sometimes in the form of protests, like the one when the former Soviet secret police chief Alexander Shalepin came to Britain in 1975. They are deeply concerned not only by the flagrant and widespread violation of human and national rights in Ukraine, but also by the Soviet policy of Russification, that is, the denationalization of the non-Russian nations of the USSR and their assimilation into the dominant Russian culture. Following the death of Stalin, a brief period of relaxation in the nationality sphere made possible a remarkable revival in the cultural and public life of Ukraine. It was spearheaded by the courageous generation of the 60s, composed mainly of young literary intellectuals who boldly opposed Khrushchev's decision to step up once again the policy of Russification. A wave of arrests in 1965 not only failed to silence dissenters in Ukraine, but actually precipitated the emergence of a Ukrainian human and national rights movement. In 1970, the young Ukrainian historian Valentin Moroz received a draconian 14-year sentence for his powerful protest writing. At the beginning of 1972, the KGB launched a massive crackdown in Ukraine, which was designed to crush the growing national assertiveness of the Ukrainians. Purges affected every sector of Ukrainian life, and even Petro Shelis, the party boss in Ukraine, was removed from his post. Hundreds of persons, mainly young writers, artists and scholars, were sentenced to inhumanly severe terms of imprisonment. The most talented and courageous representatives of an entire generation are now in labor camps, prisons and psychiatric hospitals. We asked Peter Redway, an authority on Soviet affairs, about the importance of the Ukrainian problem. I think of all the many different forms of dissent in the Soviet Union that have developed in the last 15 years or so, the national minority dissent is what worries the authorities more than anything else. The strongest movements have been in the Ukraine and Lithuania, with important but less powerful movements in Latvia, Estonia, Georgia, Armenia, and a few others. The seriousness of the Ukrainian problem relates, I think, to the fact that the Ukraine is economically so important to the Soviet Union, and that if a strong national movement was able to express itself, secessionist tendencies might develop and Ukraine might eventually secede from the Union. So the KGB has cracked down very, very hard in the mid-60s and again in 1972, suppressing virtually all forms of national Ukrainian dissent. And I think they put it at the very top of their priorities in dealing with discontent and dissent. Today, conditions in Ukraine remain extremely oppressive. The most recent example concerns the 1975 Helsinki Agreement, which included provisions about human rights. As in other parts of the Soviet Union, a group to monitor the Soviet government's observance of this international agreement was set up in Ukraine at the beginning of 1977. Though the Soviet government is a signatory of the Helsinki Final Act, it has responded by imprisoning at least six members of this small group. In June 1977, the Ukrainian Helsinki Group's chairman, the well-known writer Mykola Rudenko, received a sentence of 12 years. His colleague, the teacher, Alexa Tichy, was sentenced to a staggering total of 15 years. A couple of weeks ago, another two members of this group were both given 12-year sentences. Very recently, a, a wider movement in defense of workers' rights in the USSR has emerged, headed by Volodymyr Khlebanov, another Ukrainian. The Soviet attitude towards the Ukrainian problem can be seen in this tonight interview of last year with one of the editors of Pravda. There are all kinds of things happening in the Soviet Union which simply do not appear in Pravda. For instance, at the moment, there are two members of the Ukrainian Helsinki Committee who are being tried on charges of anti-Soviet activity. Why is this trial not reported in the Soviet press? <laughs> Fine. If that's what you're interested in, it's your affair. But as far as the legal activities of the entire Soviet Union are concerned, well, of course, we can't report every single case or every trial. It's natural. Just as the English press probably doesn't print accounts of every single action by the British legal authorities or organs, 
Если же вы имеете в виду, uh, в виду людей, которых... But if you're talking about people that the Western, the bourgeois press makes out to be martyrs, well, those people, we've got a word for them here, malcontents. They represent no one, and their activities don't interest our readers either. Деятельность тоже не интересует наших читателей. But if, for instance, there were a group of people who were arguing the case for, say, a, a separatist movement in the Ukraine, where could, in which newspaper in the Soviet Union, could they express their views? We don't have any such group. If there were such a group. And if the Martians landed in England? И треножники пойдут на Лондон, что тогда? And if Triffids marched on London, what then? Behind the facade of a federal structure, the USSR remains a vast Russian empire. The constitutional rights of the non-Russian republics exist only on paper. All important decisions are made in Moscow. Even though Soviet Ukraine has its own seat at the United Nations, foreign diplomats and journalists are not allowed to work in this republic. Any complaints about the denial of basic civil liberties, Russification and national discrimination are answered with repression.